Hello and welcome back in Other Waters. First things first, let's try taking, eating something, I guess. What? Eating. Maybe some onion tissue. Oh, it's a brain map. Good. Can use it. This hole cuts deep into the bedrock of the plane. Could this be caused by a sink that's more like an impact radar? Different individuals of this species seem to have varying sizes of bubbles on their back. Are they carrying oxygen in them? The curve of the lecture extends out of sight, and the other side of this vast depression is too far out into the dark deep sea. Brian pulls more of the plane on all sides, densely packed around the vast lake. This rise products out towards the vast brain lake to the east, cutting between deep pools. Unlike the shallow sick marks to the south, this deep crater plunge through the silt of the bedrock. I think cause whale is between the pools away from the lake. The brain gathers in the smoke crater like a settled storm. It would be beautiful if it wasn't so toxic. Something is emitting a faint glow beneath the brain. It has the sharp shape of a shell, perhaps skeletal remains. The seal bank allows passage between the two parallel strips of craters leading north. The pools seem to continue to the north, but why do they stretch so far away from the main body of the lake? Empty of brain, this crater was further caused by a large impact, showing radial cracks in the rock spreading from a single point. The pools seem to cover a huge part of the seabed, radiating out from the lake in only markings. Despite the toxic brine on all sides, this glowing oasis clings to its rock, even as it is melting away. Precariously seeded among the pools, this fan shows sides, signs of decay, its amber waves of light shattering and flickering unevenly. These fans seem to play a central role in the ecosystem here. I'm going to start recording data. Mm. Like the fans found in the bloom, these creatures are fan shaped filter feeders, however, these variants glow with a gold fire. What are these petal shaped creatures? They only run around the glowing fans. Trefoil petals which gather around the glowing fans of the deep, they angle themselves toward the light. Like expecting children. Some of these more northern pools are emptying of brine, leaving only shallow layers of their beds.
The arrow we must have been attracted by some signal and it falls, but it became another victim of the course of dying. This smooth plane is trying to clear of Pluto's tribe, but must be the course of the snow game as well. One of Mia's ROVs, it looks like this one was disabled by the brine. The supplies Mia equipped it with are still intact though, we can resupply. Open the terminal and let's see what this other guy found down uh. here. Oh wow, you found something big, didn't you little guy? It looks like... Is that a wreck? Incredible, this debris field stretches all the way northwest from here. It must have been large, a freighter or a research vessel. We have to go see this thing. Come on, we can head back to base after. Whatever caused the string of impact craters, parts of it fly all around, huge joint forms of cloud of metal. Here's the edge of the debris trail. Something sank here and by the spread of debris exploded. It has been here for years, decades. The metal scored to a little more than a frame. That means Mina wasn't the first person to come here. Something big happened here, something no one was meant to find. This huge piece of debris has been distorted and twisted by the brine, leaving it totally unrecognizable. Mobile's rust red lamps are scattered across the pale sand like seeds thrown to the wind. The spores of the frame stick out of the sand like fractured ribs, front and other parts closing the gaps between them. The broad flat plates of the wreck sit at right angles to each other. And a complex of angular walls. A curved strip performs an hour walkway beneath the pools beside the wreck. I'll call these mournful creatures brain striders. They are walking lanterns coming out in the dark. A silk-lipped crab-like creature that clears the current pool of dead remains, providing a habitat for growing life in its white shell. Each one of these shelled creatures seems to have its own territorial loop, an area of seed where it systematically searches through. A warm glow lights the cracked uh, and corroded skin of the twisted plates in sharp relief. Crowns crowd this piece of debris, some eaten away by the little grazers. Broken rims lie all around with something of the small pieces. We could, but we don't need things. Unless. Let's get rid of brain shop. Press the link. The fan has stuck itself into the side of a vast corroded plate from an oasis in the shadow of the rock. Significantly taller than the bloom's fans, these creatures seem to favor the rocky substrate of the ocean floor's basal pillars. Each of the white petals has patterns of stomata and stamen across its surface, and from these, some kind of pole is drifting out in clumps. For something, this will be back. Oh, we already did that. There's nothing left.
Let's talk to the zombies first. Tires of towering crab like creatures who each live among the brine pools. Their tall, red reed like legs keep their carapace from toxic filters that claim most other creatures. The bones and shells of creatures that die to the brine pools adorn the striders' carapaces. Both in the brine by a pair of boxing of claws, among these rocky piles, smears of violence is full of blue. This place in life, whatever it is, finds shelter in the ways the strides collect. Why do the striders make these creatures a home in the first place? I am also curious how, if the striders are vulnerable to the brine, do adolescents reach the heights required to survive? In order to understand more about these obscure creatures, perhaps we need to analyze the glowing brine clock of the Analysis of the brine clock's shell reveals a complex chain of chemical reactions. Among this chemical richness, a form of extremophile bacteria feeds on the brine's chemical traces. When the strides collect these remains, they also collect the bacterial colonies that live on them. Removed from the brain, but still feeding on the chemical saturated shells and bones, these bacterial colonies produce a bright glow, a side effect of their metabolism. Do the strides know that they are turning themselves into pale beacons? What is the nature of the relationship between these bacteria and the striders? I need to understand more about the life cycle of a strider and how they grow to such heights. Analysis of a juvenile strider's carapace paints an enigmatic but beautiful picture. The adornments of shell and bone only begin as the brine strider mature, matures, each arrangement being the life's work of that individual. Though the striders often live apart from each other, it seems that they still commun communicate. Their adornments, which grow taller and brighter, act as beacons. They can signal for food, signal to mate, they keep company from afar. Gathering the remains of their glowing bacterial coins is a ritualistic process, a way for each of these large and ponderous creatures to create an identity within this ecosystem, through a living, growing, growing work of biological sculpture. Snare veils are unique, soft-bodied creatures that resemble a thin sheet of silk studded with light. Found in tangles of multiple individuals, their hypnotic swaying and flickering lights make them difficult to see in their entire entirety. But from my initial observations, they appear to be flat panels of bioluminescent cells which are faintly veined with both a nervous and digestive system. Veils survive by capturing creatures which swim into their surface somehow stunning or killing them and then digesting them on the exterior of their bodies. I have also observed veils passing prey from one individual to another, suggesting that they have some form of social interaction between individuals. Analysis of the digest remain that I leave behind might give some clues as to the behavior. behavior. Analysis of unknown remains found nearby a veil of tangle shows that this creature captures and kills its prey through an electro electro electrical charge. This charge, presumably produced by electric organs that sit beneath the veil's outer membrane, can produce incredibly high voltage outputs, and the remains analyzed show significant damage from these electrical discharges. The remains also suggest that the veil's use electrical pulses to control the muscles and nervous system of captured creatures, forcing them to swim deeper into the grip of the veil when captured. The veil's manipulation of electrical signals seem highly nuanced, and they may also use them for the detection of prey and even communication between individuals. In order to confirm these theories, analysis of veil tissue is necessary. 
although this may prove difficult. Brine eaters are hairy, frond like creatures that live in clumps around glades 67 cc's deep ocean brine pools. Looking like large, dark, overgrown ferns, they sway their branches' limbs through their pools, whisking the cloudy brine as they do. Each frond is thick with bristles, which are often caked in a bright orange substance that reacts to the brine on contact. Brightening as it does, what exactly the substance is, or does it or does is difficult to tell, but it seems that the eaters intentionally foster its growth on their limbs, using their matted hair to keep it attached. Individual eaters can be hard to isolate from the clumps they live in, making additional observations difficult. Understanding more about these creatures will require us to gather some samples. Analyzing samples of the bacteria which grows among the hairs of the brine eaters, Franz has shown that it is their main source of nutrition. This bacteria, which is extremely full in nature, is able to metabolize the toxic brine the eater dips it into. The eater repeatedly dips the bacteria into the brine in order to regulate its growth, with each dip causing a rapid increase in reproduction within the bacterial colony. When the eater's limb is thick with orange microbes, it then wipes it across another frond where much of the bacteria is quickly digested by the creature, leaving just enough behind on the limb to regrow the colony. It seems the name brine eater is a misnomer. It is the bacteria which eats the brine, and eaters just consume the bacteria. Inspecting the tissue of a brine eater shows that despite a full nervous system, they have no central brain. In fact, regeneration present in the tissue samples suggests that a brine eater could be regrown from just a single piece of an individual, and is highly resistant to predatory damage. With no central cells to orient themselves around, brine eaters are a highly resilient form of life, which is perhaps how they have come to exist in one of the harshest environments of Glee's 667cc, the shore of a brine lake. They are, also, they are so resilient, in fact, that I would expect that brine eaters and their variants may be found all across this ocean, each one grown from the smallest fragment of, the, of one original individual deep in the past of this planet. There's still something to be found over here. It's so big. And we need to go back here, I guess, I think. Something else to have. We may can try go over here. I always uh, request drone to pick us up. Uh, it's just a flower, a sample, not a flower. Because it was a fan. Along the edge of the larger pools, the shells and the skeletons of creatures grown out of the cell, big victims of the toxic brine. A bank which skirts along the edge of a large shadowed pool. Place where we found Minai. Actually, I see we are heading to the moon, so for now, thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon. Bye!